Winter. My first winter in Montana was a memorable one. The muscle shell region that had been in the center of the buffalo hunters turned out to be a hangout for cattle rustlers by 1884. There were a number of men there that had been dependent on buffalo hunting for a living. As the last of the herds were killed off, many of these men became woodhawks. That is, they made a business of cutting cordwood and of exchanging it for supplies that the steamboats brought up the Missouri from St. Louis. This business was slow and rather unprofitable, and by 82 and 83, a number of them were aligned in stealing cattle. The biggest ranch in the vicinity was the ranch at Fort McGinnis, belonging to Granville Stewart and Reese Anderson, and their brand was the DHS. The cattle rustling business was pe- playing havoc with the DHS herd, which ranged over acres and acreages of wild, unfenced country. The DHS outfit took it upon itself to organize a vigilante committee. This committee was headed by Flopping Bill, an old buffalo hunter and experienced woodsman who had obtained his subsequent through a trick he had of turning his double-bladed axe over in the air after every stroke. The work of the vigilante committee was rapid and thorough. During the spring and summer of 1883, they hanged or shot 23 men on the banks of the Missouri near the head of the mussel shell. Among the victims were the Downey brothers, who had been running a store and a big supply station at the fork of the Missouri in the mussel shell. When our herd reached the site of the store on October 20th, 1884, the only remains besides the store building itself was a pile of beer bottles as high as the house. I don't know how many boxes of cartridges were used polishing off marksmanship, by tossing the beer bottles into the Missouri and shooting off the neck just as one appeared on the surface of the water. Evidently, there was not too much Irish blood in this group of cowboys. At least the ghosts of the Downey brothers did not haunt them. Camp was set with the old Downsy store building as headquarters. The men set to work immediately to cut cottonwood logs and build corrals at the mouth of Large Polk Creek a mile up the mussel shell. Johnny Burgess, the manager of Nebman's outfit, had a brand legally registered and the work of branding was begun. By the time the fall work was done, the winter had set in. I've been in Montana 40 years or more now, and I haven't known a colder winter than that of the 1884. There had been no time to gather hay that fall, and the outfit lived in hope that the light snows occasionally removed by a Chinook would make it possible for the cattle to winter on buffalo grass. A supply of oats was put in to feed the saddle horses. However, it was quite evident that the supply was not going to fill the demands of our armada of Texas horses, whose appetites were being fawned by wintry Montana winds. All but three or four horses were finally turned loose to shift for themselves in the hills surrounding the ranch. Regardless of this precaution, the supply of oats had run out by the 1st of January. A thermometer was not part of the NBAR equipment. And although the southern bred cowboy knew that this was no Texas winter, they did not realize what extremes a thermometer would have reached in this particular January. However, Johnny Burgess did know that he wasn't going to let the stock that remained with us starve. He knew that a fall steamboat load of oats shipped to Rocky Point, 45 miles up the Missouri. He decided that someone in the outfit must take the trip to Rocky Point. He had a Hans Hansen in the bunch who came out to Mile City that fall to trap along the Missouri. Hans had fulfilled his purpose in coming to the extent of some 60 beaver pelts, a number of coyote, wolf, and antelope hides, and he was anxious to get his fine collected to market and realize the big financial return such heavy pelts were bound to bring. I wasn't hankering much to be out of doors, but I was ready to try anything for a variation from the regular routine. Hanson and I volunteered, and Burgess was ready to go with us. It was the 1st of January when we hitched up two wagons, put in a camping outfit, and started for Rocky Point. The ranch headquarters was located on the slope between the Missouri River and a clump of pine trees which grew along the ridge of the slope itself parallel to the river. The snow was deep on the slope itself, and there was no trail. For guidance and protection, we turned to the ridge. The bulky open frame wagons creaked along the ridge and the brittle sounds they made, all that broke on the awful silence. I don't believe going to exile in Siberia could be much more terrifying. At the close of the first day, we pulled off the ridge into the wide bottom sag full of pines. 
We were desperately cold and with unusual speed we managed to collect a pile of pine logs. We piled about 15 up in the clearing in record time and started a fire in the center of the pile. And as log burned through the center, we would throw the two ends into the fire and keep our fire renewed. As soon as we took the harness off a horse, we had to hurry to rub him down to keep the moist parts of him from freezing. The way we made our bed that night was a matter of life and death. First, we cleared away two foot of snow from a space on the ground large enough to spread about half the length of an 18 foot tarpaulin. Burgess and I had a cowpuncher's mattress. This was rather thin padding hinged through the center so that it could be doubled to soften a bed for one cowboy or extended when necessary to accommodate two men. We spread the mattress on the tarp and each of us hauled out our 12 pairs of blankets for bedding. We drove stakes in the snow above the head of the bed and pulled the tarp back over the entire bed and rested it on the stakes. All our equipment, including our saddles, were protected under the tarp. Hansen had it over us for that night, at least as far as warm and luxurious beds were concerned. He hauled out his pile of pelts and slept in a bed of fur a foot thick. We drove hard all the next day and urged on because of the cold we kept going after dark. It got to be about 9 o'clock at night, and although we were stricken to the ridge, we were beginning to wonder a light about directions when we saw a few dim lights of Rocky Point, known today as Wilder's Ferry. We reached the store feeling pretty numb and not knowing much what it was all about. When we came, they told us that the thermometer was registering 57 below zero. I had to look at the thermometer for myself, and when I saw it, I almost stiffened out again. We didn't have the advantage of radio to antiquate us with what was going on on the other side of the world. There wasn't even a telegraph or telephone there at the time. But sometime later, we saw a government report from the Poplar Indian Reservation just north of us, and the temperature recorded for that night was 66 below zero. Then the temperature rose to reasonable near zero. We loaded the wagons with the coveted oats and started home over the frozen waters of the Missouri. The most tragic part of that winter was the effect of the cattle. The Texas bred cattle didn't know what it was all about and we lost almost the entire herd through an unusual situation connected with the earlier history of the place. It seems that the English were having terrible times trying to bring the breeds of Western Canada to accustom themselves to civil law. There were constant uprisings among the French Indian breeds which became a regular war in the early 70s. The morale of the breeds was broke when their leader, Ryle, and eight of his companions were hung. Other leaders escaped south into the United States and made settlements along the Muscle Shell. Their method of setting up a village was rather unusual. One family would build a three-walled shack, about 16 by 20 feet of cottonwood logs, and the next family would build three walls onto the first dwelling. There might be seven or eight extensions to the original three walls. In this way, each family saved the labor of building the fourth wall. But evidently, the breeds were not so well pleased with this part of the country, or they felt the ties of their native Canada too strong for them to resist. At any rate, when the controversy in Canada was settled, they started drifting back home. And when we came to the Muscle Shell in 84, the shacks were all deserted. About Christmas time, I was riding up the river to check up on the cattle and I found that the animals had come upon a beaver who had built their homes according to the usual water line, found that the icy water was rushing through their homes and they were forced out. When they came out of their houses, they would sit on the banks in groups of five or six as if holding counsel on the bewildering occurrence that was so violently disturbing their usual winter home. They would let you come so close that you could hear their teeth chatter before they would take the plunge into the icy waters. Being thrown out of a home in the middle of January with the temperature far below zero and the ground solidly froze must have been pretty disheartening, but with the energy characteristic of beaver, they would go below the ice and begin burrowing a new home in the bank. They would have been the winner to gather hides for a fur coat, and maybe I would have been doing them a favor, but I couldn't take advantage of them. I've always had my Winchester with me in the open, and I have had occasion to drill deer, buffalo, elk, and antelope, and once a mountain lion, but it has always been for food or protection, and never for mere destruction. 
In 1885, I made my first trip into northern Montana, scouting for Newman. Charles Razor was with me. He was scouting for the Lee Scott Cattle Company. Each of us had two pack and two saddle horses to make the trip into this country. I struck a deep coulee running into Milk River near Hinsdale, and I explored the milk from St. Mary's to the mouth and returned to report Newman as fine a grazing country as could be found. Side note. This deep coulee hit by Rudder in 1885 is believed to be Tank Coulee, a place where my family homesteaded and still runs cattle to this day. This valley had been for years for hunting grounds of the Gross Venture, the Blackfoot, the Pegans, and the Bloods. There was abundant game even when I was there and Joe Butch, who trapped and hunted in the 60s and 70s, had seen some local histories, saw antelopes so thick in the bottoms between the Missouri and the milk that you couldn't shirt your way through them. He and a trapper by name of Hammond had wolves piled up by the hundreds one winter, waiting to skin them in the spring and ship them up the Missouri. But the Indians got rather familiar and the hunters moved on to the fort. There were no Indian uprisings after 1876, and when I went through in 85, the Indians were on the reservation. The Great Northern was just building in Dakota, and Milk River Valley was a wilderness. I went back and reported to Newman the rich grazing lands as I had ever gone over. The next winter, we were located about 110 miles from Mile City, without even a stagecoach to come within 70 miles with the mail. About every two weeks, someone went for mail, that is, when the weather permitted. It was a distance of about 90 miles on horseback, sometimes with no returns. I have seen the trip made to Mile City, 110 miles in one day with one horse, and the same horse carried me back over the distance the next day. We didn't often get to Mile City, but when we did, the town certainly knew we were there. There was a singing cowboy in our outfit who went by the nickname of Teddy Blue. That was all I ever heard him called, although his name was Abbott. He spent most of his evenings making up words and tunes and putting them together. On one of the trips to Mile City, after being isolated on the ranch for months, Teddy Blue was feeling especially enthusiastic about his entertaining abilities, and he decided to give the town folks a treat. He went up to the theater of the village and told the proprietor that he had a song he'd like to sing for the folks. The proprietor hesitated, but for some reason he didn't voice an objection. All right, he said. Teddy told him it was a brand new song and he'd like to introduce it on horseback. Then, without waiting for objections, Teddy mounted his horse and rode into the theater and up the aisle. Before the audience knew what was happening, he had jumped his mount to the stage, doffed his hat, and with a sweeping bow, he let go on a cowboy song that nearly raised the roof of the theater. In 1887, I was taking a beef herd from the Little Powder country to the Cheyenne Agency. The trail was along the East Fork of the Little Powder, and one night we made camp in the shelter of some sand dunes. When we went to exploring for firewood, we found that the dunes were in a basin surrounded by pine hills. Among the hills and not far from where we had made camp, we found a coulee lined with petrified logs. This set us to looking around for more discoveries. Most of the dunes were grazed over, showing that the wind had not shifted them for some time. However, the wind cutting down through a gulch in the hills had slowly worked on one of the dunes cutting off the top of it. One of the fellows went investigating in the hollow of the dune and came across a skeleton that didn't look like anything he had ever seen before. He knew better than to come back and tell us about it and expect us to believe it. He called us over to see for ourselves. The skeleton was between 20 and 25 feet long and most of the bones seemed to be intact. The bones indicated a pointed head, a long neck, and a tapering tail, and we accused it of being a dinosaur. The bones of the spinal column showed a fan-shaped formation, just back of the shoulders making a hump similar to a buffalo hump, but much larger. No one could suggest a plausible reason why the bones had not been shifted or disarranged in the shift of the sand years before, and we regretted that Hornaday and his hunt for choice specimens of buffalo had not come upon this spot. The winter of 1886 and 87 was a memorable one for cattlemen in Montana. It was not so cold as it had been in 85, but there was more snow and the cattle couldn't find feed. Big cattle companies who had brought thousands of head of Texas cattle into Montana the preceding summer found themselves facing bankruptcy the next spring. 
In some cases, whole herds were wiped out. Newman's herd had been reduced from about 60,000 head to a little better than 9,000 by the ravaging winter and sold out to Tommy Cruz, a Helena banker and well-known stock and sheepman of Fergus County. In 1889, Nidoringus brothers put about 30,000 head on a ranch in Valley County on Rock Creek. In the country I had been through a few years before when I went to work for them as a range foreman on that ranch. That time the Homeland and Cattle Company, as the Nyrgis Brothers outfit was called, was one of the largest in this part of the country. There must have been 80,000 head in their grazing territory that extended from Missouri to Canada, east to Dakota, and west to the head of the Muscle Shell, bearing the N Bar N brand. They were almost as well known for their unusually large stock of horses. At one time we collected all the horses we could round up to be broken. It was a big job, but breaking horses was my long suit. And when we had finished, the boss must have been satisfied with the result. Anyhow, he gave me 15 of the choice animals of the bunch. In 1891, I got back on the trail again, this time for a trail boss for a crew that took 1,600 head of horses into the cattle country near Windor, Wyoming, and brought back 30,000 head of cattle. To me, Milk River Valley country has always been an ideal range country, and always will be. The wide stretch of open range area and the quality of the soil, combined with the climatic conditions, was producing ideal feed for thousands of buffalo, which grazed over the country before the days of the big killings. That region today, with its 40,000 acres and the irrigation project underway, is well known for the famous blue joint hay, as good a cattle feed as can be found and commands a high price any time. But for grain production, well, I'm just a biased old cattleman and anything I say won't bring back the long-legged, very colored, untamed longhorns that we brought into the valley to supplant the buffalo. There were a number of reasons for the rather sudden disappearance of the big herds from this part of Montana. One of the main factors, I do believe, was this part of the country was the last of Montana's grazing area to be taken up as cow country. Our herds in 84 were about the last of the big herds out of Texas and the first into the Milk River Valley area. By the time the business was well established, the price of beef was going down and some of the stockmen were overly anxious to sell. Then our outfit by 95 was becoming pretty corrupt. A group of men from Texas came into control of our outfit. There was Steve Roop who came to the Big Dry in 85 with a herd of Texas cattle. At that time he went by the name of Harry Arnold because he had been mixed up in a killing scrape in Texas. In 86 or 87, he went back to Texas to stand trial. Some uncle with money to back him managed to get Steve out of it. The next year, Steve and a group of associates came up into our country with some Texas cattle. They landed jobs with our outfit and stayed. Some of his colleagues were Broom, Coffer, and Jim Snearley. And there seemed to be no way of telling what men were in cahoots with Bill Hardy and the big cattle rustler of that era. But though the law couldn't reach them, they managed to thin out their number by the survival of the fittest process. Jim Snearley's boy, just a kid at the time, went to the Dakotas with Hartley to sell a bunch of horses that the rustlers had taken from Valley County stockmen. After the horses had been sold, Hardy and young Snearley got into an argument about the division of the money and Hardy shot the boy. Besides rustlers and the low price of cattle, there was an immigration from Minnesota and Dakota of foreigners in search of agricultural lands, a movement which encouraged the former settlers also to try grain farming. The final breakup of the Niederingus Company came in 1897 and was a rather inglorious finish. The manager, Loss Blackburn, I believe allowed himself to be roped in on an ingenious plan contract with the West Cattle Company of McNamara and Marlowe. The contract specified that the Rock Creek Company was to supply 6,000 head of beef in the spring of 97 to McNamara and Marlowe. The cattle were to be loaded at Oswego and the western buyers were to pay the cost of shipping to Big Sandy. But the catch clause in the contract was this. For every head under 6,000 that Blackburn failed to furnish, he was to pay a forfeit of $20. 
It was a ridiculous situation, but it never occurred to Blackburn that he couldn't collect 6,000 head of cattle from the thousands of acres in his territory after the range had been so recently stocked with 30,000 head. But when spring came, the outfit hunted every coulee and shrub and managed to gather just 2,400 head to ship. McNamara and Marlowe, instead of paying the freight, left it to be collected from the Eastern Cattle Company. Because, as their contract showed, that company, after shipping about 2,500 head of cattle, still owed them $20 apiece for every additional head up to 6,000 that they failed to furnish. The case went to court, of course, even to a federal court, and Nybronners had the satisfaction of winning in court, although it was an expensive victory.